Item Number SCP-2200 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures The current instance of SCP-2200-2 is to be kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber at Biosite-59. To prevent the relocation of SCP-2200-1, a minimum of five armed security personnel must escort SCP-2200-2 to Termination Chamber T-28 once a month to assist in routine D-Class cycling. In the event SCP-2200-1 relocates, Mobile Task Force Epsilon-30 Blade Fielders, is to be deployed to seek out and contain the new SCP-2200-2 instance. The area of land encompassing SCP-2200-3 has been designated Site-502 with Foundation faculty members living as residents in the town proper. As SCP-2200-3 is populated by anomalous individuals, faculty may acknowledge the existence of anomalous activity in general, but are not to divulge details on any SCP object besides SCP-2200. Each staff member living on-site is to submit a weekly report detailing their experience and interactions. For all intents and purposes, SCP-2200-3 is to remain an autonomous community with minimal political and social interference by the Foundation. Additional intervention may be ordered by the presiding on-site staff lead at their discretion. As the number of inert instances are already in storage for testing and archival purposes, additional inert SCP-2200-4 are to be collected and melted down for use in funding Foundation activities. Description. SCP-2200 is the collective designation of several interrelated anomalous phenomena. SCP-2200-1 is a sword, 80 cm in length composed of an alloy of silver and copper, estimated to have been constructed between 1000 and 500 BCE. SCP-2200-1 is luminescent, giving off blue light at a level of brightness directly proportional to the number of SCP-2200-4 subjects residing in SCP-2200-3. Similarly, increased numbers of SCP-2200-4 subjects reverses deterioration caused by SCP-2200-1's age, making it a more effective weapon. SCP-2200-2 refers to the human individual who is currently bonded with SCP-2200-1. SCP-2200-2 subjects cannot separate themselves from SCP-2200-1, and any attempt to forcibly remove it from the subject's grasp will result in the immediate death of the subject. Similarly, surgical removal of the hand or arm bonded to SCP-2200-1 will also result in death. When an SCP-2200-2 instance dies, SCP-2200-1 anomalously relocates into the hand of another individual and instantly bonds with them. There is no apparent limit to the distance SCP-2200-1 can travel when transporting itself to a new subject. SCP-2200-1 appears to selectively bond with subjects that share a similar set of traits. See Document 2200-A which suggests that it may be intelligent to some degree. Bonding with SCP-2200-1 will cause subjects to suffer from an anomalous form of argiosis, which causes their skin to rapidly develop a distinct blue hue. If an SCP-2200-2 subject does not end a human life for an extended period of time, SCP-2200-1 will relocate itself. After bonding with SCP-2200-1, SCP-2200-2 subjects experience heightened epinephrine and testosterone levels and immediately gain an understanding of SCP-2200 in its entirety. These factors, combined with the SCP-2200-2 subject's background see Document 2200-A, have invariably resulted in SCP-2200-2 killing those around them with SCP-2200-1. SCP-2200-3 is a 50 km square area of land located in Whenever a person is killed by SCP-2200-1, a likeness of the individual formed out of an anomalous silver-based alloy SCP-2200-4 will appear in SCP-2200-3. Despite being made of inorganic material, instances of SCP-2200-4 are fully animate and capable of vocalization. Interviews have shown that SCP-2200-4 instances share the personality and memories of the victim they resemble. Because of their metallic composition, 
SCP-2200-4 cease aging after their conversion and are resistant to physical damage. SCP-2200-4 do not need to eat, drink, or sleep in order to sustain themselves, but may perform these actions if they so choose. Instances of SCP-2200-4 that leave SCP-2200-3 will cease animation upon setting foot outside the designated 50 km square space. SCP-2200-4 instances seem to be innately aware of the dimensions of the safe area. Any that leave remain permanently inert and cannot be restored by being returned to SCP-2200-3. Document 2200-A Characteristics shared by SCP-2200-2 subjects Between 16 and 34 years of age Physically active Strong fear of death Negative view of what happens after death Psychological or emotional instability. Interview 2200-I-0015 Interviewed SCP-2200-2.037, a 36-year-old male from British Columbia. Interviewer Dr. Stems. Forward. Interview was conducted on two days after SCP-2200-2.037 was detained. Begin log. Alright, we're going to run through this one one more time for the records. Please describe the series of events that transpired after SCP-2200-1 appeared in your hand. One moment I was just sitting in my bedroom reading, when all of a sudden I had this… this vision. I saw this place where people could live forever. I mean, on an intellectual level I was aware that what I saw was impossible, but at the same time I was convinced it was true, and I knew that I could send people there with the sword. What was your first course of action? I waited until dark. I live alone so nobody noticed me going out in the middle of the night. Whenever I came across some homeless person sleeping alone, I'd slit their throat or stab them in the heart or something like that. It went on for a few nights until I got caught by the cops. They turned me over to you guys and, well, here I am. I see. Anything else you'd like to add? I want to make it clear that I'm not a psychopath or anything. I sent those people away because death could have come for them at any moment. What if they weren't right with God? The way I see it, when someone is sent to that place, they're basically guaranteed eternal life. I was eliminating the risk of hell for them, you know? I know it sounds terrible, but I had good intentions. I wasn't really killing them, just sending them to heaven, kind of. Or at least keeping them safe from the alternative. Thank you for your time. End log. Interview 2200-I-0124 Interviewed SCP-2200-2.082 A 29-year-old female from Washington, United States Interviewer Researcher Awataki Forward Interview was conducted on Three weeks after SCP-2200-2.082 was detained. Begin log. Okay, we're going to be recording this time. If you're ready, please describe the series of events that transpired after SCP-2200-1 appeared in your hand. I immediately knew that my life was pretty much over. I knew that I couldn't let go of the sword. Ever. All my plans for my life, my career, my family, all of it was gone. But at the same time, I guess I thought I had an opportunity. Were you happy with the situation? No. God no. I would have given anything to stop what happened. So why did you do it? Don't you judge me, not for a second. What would you do if you could keep your loved ones alive forever? My sister died when she was six. How could I be sure that my kids wouldn't die young too? Twenty second pause. I may have saved them, but I hated doing it. It destroyed me. Honestly, after I finished with my family, saving strangers felt like a walk in the park in comparison. God, I still can't believe any of this happened. I'm surprised the police didn't just shoot me on the spot. That's what usually happens, makes things much more difficult for us. If you see my family, please tell them I'm sorry. I'll pass that on, thank you for your cooperation. I know these past few weeks haven't been easy for you. End log. Interview 2200-I-0207 Interviewed SCP-2200-4.00581 a 68-year-old male religious leader in SCP-2200-3. Interviewer Researcher Pittinger Begin Log If you would, please describe the Exodus movement to me as if I was unfamiliar with it. 
Certainly. Here in Solberg, or Silverville, whatever you want to call it, there are a multitude of people who fear what awaits when they cross the threshold and give up their life. Those of us who are of faith believe that this is more of a purgatory than the paradise that God intended for us. You see, this place is founded on the fear of what happens after death. Once you've been sent here by the sword, you can postpone your fate as long as you like. Your life will only end when you cross the city limits. The Exodus Movement is a religious initiative that seeks to help Solberg citizens come to them with their mortality and willingly pass on to their next world. If you believe in an afterlife, why would you yourself not cross the threshold as well? Some of us believers have to remain to maintain the church and continue to spread the good news. As much as I desire to meet my Heavenly Father, I stay behind so that I might aid those who are still shackled by fear and doubt. Opponents of the Exodus movement have accused you of merely wanting to reduce overpopulation and increase your field of influence. How do you answer these allegations? I can understand why you would think such things. As long as the Church has existed, so have its critics. Even among believers, there are those who believe crossing the threshold to be a sin, as it equates to suicide. Disagreements are given in matters of religion. Any additional comments you would like me to record? This society is built upon man's fear of death. Whether you believe in heaven or hell, afterlife or finality, you must ask yourself, is the pursuit of immortality truly virtuous? By choosing to remain safe in our silver shells, we rob ourselves of our dignity. By fearing death, we only give it more power. End log.